Hi, I'm James Dunn. Welcome to the Inside Network. Welcome to In Depth, and my guest is Simon Ford, who's Managing Director of the new investment firm, Cordis Asset Management, which has been formed to specialise in medical technology investment. Welcome, Simon. Thanks, James. Simon, can you walk us through your background and the essence of what Cordis has been set up to do and, and what the Global Medical Technology Fund is going to specialise in? Sure. Um, James, my background is engineering, uh, economics and investments uh, all my life. Um, Cordis was set up at the instigation of um, my founder, Professor Michael Vallali, who is a cardiovascular surgeon and head of cardiovascular surgery at um, Ohio State. He happens to be Australian. And his premise was that in the last 10 years, a lot more people are being treated for cardiovascular disease in particular and other life-threatening chronic diseases by the use of uh, medical technology and explicitly devices. So devices have become the prevalent treatment for cardiovascular disease, so fixing anything to do with your heart or your vascular system, and this has profound implications for the number of people that can be treated, the costs of treatment and the time of treatment. Um, and he and his colleagues, literally in the operating theatre, went, hey, we're doing two to three times the number of operations in a day now that we could do 10 years ago. Um, there's something very interesting going on here. It's a major phenomena and, an, and a major investment opportunity in the, in the devices themselves. So over the last 10 years or so, as in many fields, the, the revolution in technology, such as computer-aided design and 3D printing, robotics, microchip, AI, software technology, they've clearly advanced uh, things in the medical field as, as, as they have in, in virtually every other field. Can you walk us through the impact that technology has had in medicine and how that's changed the way you look at the companies in the universe that's available to you to invest in? Sure. So 10 years ago, um, a triple bypass, which uh, an alarming number of people get, or a valve replacement, or uh, parts of your vascular system would have been treated with open heart surgery. Um, and in the last 10 years, what you've seen is the um, slow but steady replacement of that open heart surgery with um, uh, catheter surgery through typically the femoral artery in your leg. Um, valves, which couldn't be replaced uh, 10 years ago, are now being replaced with little tiny um, uh, very beautifully designed uh, technology which literally replaces the valve in your heart and quite literally can extend your life for two, three, five years. We have good examples of people who've had two or three of these operations with devices that might have included stents, um, uh, aortic valve replacements, uh, aortic valve stents. Um, these have extended people's lives for, for 10 years and, and that is a regular occurrence. And that's a game changer in terms of healthcare. And as the world expects to live a longer, more active life, then your ability to replace virtually all parts of the heart and other parts of your, your um, body with uh, technology is, is something that we all expect and we all will get. And that's, um, that change is, is that we're at the beginnings of a technology revolution uh, that we believe will go on for decades. Uh, not necessarily one that's uh, flown the coop, as it were. So is it really some of the things that uh, people might expect to see, such as software, such as AI, but, but, but really miniaturisation and engineering at the nano scale and, and, and design, computer-aided design, that have really totally changed the way we look at what's achievable in, in, in therapies in the human body? Yeah, absolutely, James. So, so a, a, a typical device, let's say a heart valve, um, if it, it, you know, 10 years ago, it was replaced surgically. They opened you up and, they, and, they, and if your aortic valve, which is the, the, one of the first to go, started to generate, they opened you up and either stitched it up or replaced it with a small valve. These days, um, the technology is, is, is called transcatheter aortic 
valve replacement. Mm -hmm. So it's, there's a catheter which is put up through your femoral artery in, up uh, into the heart and it replaces that uh, valve with a little tiny uh, valve that opens up, just uh, it, it pulls open and sits in the valve. Um, and on that, uh, the, the, the result of technology is the design of the device itself, the design of the insertion technique, the manufacturing technique, mm -hmm. which will include all sorts of materials technology and um, very delicate computer added design, 3D uh, manufacturing, customization, all of that, as we know, has improved in the last 10 years for the same reason as your mobile phones improved. Um, and that, that has transformed um, heart surgery in particular. It's significantly transformed uh, the quality of life for diabetics where uh, continuous glucose monitoring um, it now comes out through your telephone and better still can be monitored by your doctor remotely. Mm. Um, that's really only in the last five years. And so this 10-year uh, revolution has been really quite extraordinary. Um, I, I'm a trustee of a medical research institute and the director called the last 10 years the industrial revolution of medical science. And we're seeing that in all forms, in other areas as well, but particularly in device technology. And a lot of people perhaps wouldn't understand, they think there's clever people doing clever things, but still the company structure is, is the one that really harnesses the ingenuity. And, and so there is this universe of listed companies available to you to participate in that technology and, and benefit from it. Absolutely. So if you look around the world, um, as not surprisingly, a lot of great people have a lot of great ideas but bringing them to market, getting them approved, getting them patented, being allowed to put them into somebody's body um, and then making a commercial success of it is, is a very major and extensive operation. And so we are focused on the uh, major companies, the listed companies globally that are uh, making and distributing devices that have been through that process, that have been approved and are out in the market generating revenue. Um, now, that's a slightly more rarefied atmosphere than the entire technology spectrum. Uh, there's around about 100 companies that fit that category. Of those, um, we are investing in the, the leading 25 of those companies mm. at any time. Um, and across large, medium and small cap mm. spectrums, which gives us both the longer term, more stable, mm. better known companies, many of which people would know, but it also gives us um, some highly interesting and innovative mm medium cap and small cap companies um, that, that are extremely exciting in terms of what they're doing. So which stock markets are these companies listed on? What, what, what are the most uh, predominant stock exchanges in your portfolio? So 80% so of them are listed in the United States. Um, the United States leads the world in technology in all sorts of senses, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean they're domiciled there. So 60% are domiciled in the US um, and, and the rest are typically Europe, Japan, mm. Israel, uh, Australia. Um, but the, the rate of innovation mm. and the financial incentives for innovation in the US are enormous. 90% um, of all healthcare is paid for, mm. despite what you might have heard about the healthcare system. 100% for people over 65. Mm. And so as our major target market, unfortunately, is those of us who've got grey hair and a lot older and we all want to live longer, higher quality mm -hmm. lives and we expect our healthcare, healthcare systems to pay for them, that, that part of the market is being led by the US but very quickly permeating mm -hmm. out through the OECD mm -hmm. uh, and in, to an increasing extent into middle, um, middle class Asia and, mm -hmm. and the rest of the world. So for non-US companies, would you, uh, are you willing to go to the, to the actual home market to invest there or through American depository receipts in the US? No, no, absolutely. We'll go where they're listed. Mm -hmm. um, so we will have companies in the portfolio that are listed in Europe, uh, Japan, uh, potentially um, uh, Australia. Um, the Israeli companies tend to come in this space into the US, mm -hmm. so we, we pick them up there. We don't really mind where they're listed as long as it's a legitimate exchange. Um, we look at their domicile mm -hmm. and, their, and the companies at home, not, not where they're listed. So how do you filter and identify investment opportunities? You, you mentioned revenue, as obviously that's one, one of sure. your criteria. Do you have capitalisation levels? What, what other things 
Okay, so we have, we have in one set, so we have our conventional um, analytics of very comprehensive financial analytics. So everything about the company that there is to know, we know, and all the ratios of the company we know and we monitor. But then we're looking at the quality filters. Now these are these become increasingly important mm -hmm. in the device space. So how good is the device? What is the size of the market for the device? Uh, what is their market share in the device? What um, what is their rate of um, uh, distribution out into the rest of the world? What is their mm -hmm. distribution capability? Um, the quality of the opportunity is very critical. The hardest part for us is valuations. <clears throat> we're in a space that, not surprisingly. People recognise that healthcare is growing 30% faster than GDP growth. Sorry, I should say healthcare spending mm. is growing fast 30% faster than GDP. So it's a major initiative. It's a major focus of the whole world or priority. And so we're in businesses that are recognised as world leaders in their space. But um, what we are looking at in terms of valuation is what is the current treatment rate versus mm. prevalence. And by the way. In most cases, it's still a tiny fraction, mm. even in the US, let alone the OECD, mm. and let alone the rest of the world. So there's an inherent reason why these companies could be trading at 30, 40, mm -hmm. 50 times earnings. Um, but, then the, but then we're looking um, much more deeply into mm. the technology and the optionality, if you like, of the technology going into from uh, symptomatic space into asymptomatic space. or uh, only being allowed for very risky patients versus mm -hmm. uh, going into the less risky patients. And there we're getting a very good insight through our medical advisory panel. Mm -hmm. We have four of the world's well-renowned uh, cardiovascular surgeons and uh, ICU surgeons uh, who have enormous capabilities and resources across the world in the US and Australia, but the rest of the world. And, and they're giving us uh, weekly insights into the devices that are working, the devices that are not, the devices that do what they say in the box versus the devices that, that perhaps are not living up to expectations. Um, and that, that becomes um, a, a real competitive advantage in the structure of the portfolio. So do you retain the flexibility to go into something that might be pre-earnings or pre-revenue if there's an unmet, a major unmet medical need and no other device that's, that's in that area? Good question. We retain the right to go into any IPO. But, but in order to define our story, to keep our story simple, listed companies making medical devices treating chronic disease and positioning us from an investment point of view in your global equity mm. and healthcare portfolio, we are not going into unlisted investments. We have first line of sight into all of them. Uh, three of our doctors have been major inventors of, of devices, in fact, um, John Fraser in Brisbane is very well known for running a team of 80 to 100 uh, engineers, doctors, developers, and they're building one of the world's uh, leading uh, artificial hearts. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing what's happening in that space. But for our investment purposes, we want a portfolio that is um, proven and is likely to have a, uh, a, a foreseeable future of growth in the next um, 10 years. Simon, ESG considerations have become much more important in investment and asset allocation. And investing in medical technology does carry some ESG elements naturally, but are there any specific ESG considerations you take into account in the investment decision? Sure. James, ESG and impact investment doesn't get much better than prolonging your life mm. and saving your life. Um, we are certainly conscious of it and we are in the leading companies of the world that have high regulatory barriers, high reputation barriers, um, high uh, patent protection. And so by almost by definition, we're in an extremely high quality space for ESG in, in any case. Mm -hmm. We are not specifically following any ESG uh, criteria. Have you seen any major advancements, really stunning advancements post COVID? I mean, did COVID accelerate developments? Are there, are there any developments coming out of COVID that you're particularly excited about? It, it's dramatically accelerated the acceptance and the rate of remote monitoring. So in the same manner that you and I now think nothing of a Zoom call, mm -hmm. uh, whereas we might have pushed back in the past, people are now being monitored for uh, all sorts of diseases. 
and treatments mm -hmm. remotely and accepting it and want, wanting it in some senses. And that opens up an enormous healthcare opportunity um, in, in lowering the cost of healthcare and providing it to, to a lot more people more effectively. I'm interested, Simon, in the philosophy behind uh, targeting the fund at, at the devices world versus the biotech pharma world. Sure. What, what's the philosophy there? Look, biotech and pharma are obviously extremely important, particularly in COVID as it happens, uh, albeit there's a winner-take-all uh, opportunity in that space. Uh, devices are much easier to evaluate in one sense that we know if we know in three to five days if a device is doing its job, if it's doing what it says on the box. Uh, with biotechnology or pharma, there's a lot longer lead times to development and to get into the market and to commercialise and it takes a lot longer to know whether or not it worked or not or what, what level of treatment had to work. Whereas if you need a new stent, a new valve, a new pacemaker, a new defibrillator, a continuous glucose monitoring machine, uh, we can give it to you tomorrow, you probably need it tomorrow, and we know if it works the next day. So Simon, tell us exactly the parameters of the Cordis Global Medical Technology Fund, uh, structure, um, minimum investment, availability. Sure, thanks James. So, so we're, we're an Australian unit trust, registered with ASIC, uh, open to any investor. Uh, the minimum investment is 50,000. And for those who care about due diligence, which is most of us, uh, we tick the box, we're issued by EQT, um, administered by Mainstream, sub-custodians JP Morgan, uh, and we'd love people to invest starting in April. Thank you, Simon. Thanks very much for your time. Thanks, James.